Thank you, Jason, for that introduction. I'm happy to join the MLML community. I've had a great experience so far. I know I've been hunkered down over there doing a lot of writing, but I hope to get out and collaborate and interact more with everybody. Uh, so as I get started, I just want to acknowledge that the data that I'm going to show in this talk is really a collaboration between several different institutes. Uh, when I was at Ambari as a postdoc with my colleagues there, and then of course Jason's group, and then colleagues at NOAA, UCSC, and Florida Fish and Wildlife. So I'll introduce Sudanichia and the toxin that it produces, which is domoic acid. I'll give a little history uh, about this organism in Monterey Bay and the different events that we've had. And then I'll talk about how we've been studying these blooms in terms of the different platforms that we use, as well as methodology. But first, I don't know how many of you were here in 2015. You probably heard about the big warm blob that was all over the news. Um, this was a, a sea surface anomaly that uh, started actually back in 2013. But this is a snapshot of time in 2015 when the blob was sitting here off of the Pacific Northwest. We also had this. Um, this uh, band here characteristic of an El Nino year. And wherever you see reds and oranges, that means that the sea surface temperatures were anywhere from two to four degrees warmer than usual. And everybody knows that even if you change just a degree, you can really change the ecosystem. Um, and that year actually coincided with a months long bloom of this toxic organism, Sudanichia that went from Santa Barbara all the way along the coast, all the way up into the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. And that was really unprecedented because these different areas will have um, Sudanichia blooms, but usually at different times. And so researchers are really trying to, uh, still trying to untangle this, this event. But you know, it was happening down here in SoCal where they'll have a sh they have a shallow shelf where they get moderate upwelling that brings nutrients that um, the phytoplankton respond to. Here, of course, you know we have the deep canyon with strong upwelling. Uh, we uh, get a lot of um, blooms out here. And then off the west coast, they have an eddy, an offshore eddy region that um, will deliver cells onshore. So we really have three different unique systems, yet we all experience this bloom at the same time. And the fact that it lasts, lasted for months was also unprecedented. So if you were here, you may have seen some of the headlines, uh, major toxic algae growing worse and worse by the day. Uh, Washington and Oregon joined us in closing their Dungeness crab fishery. Um, we sought uh, federal disaster money because remember all of these, um, uh, these watermen that go out and depend on this um, fishery were um, just stymied at the time um, and their income was completely uh, closed off. Uh, also, recreational Dungeness crab season was closed for months, and so NOAA mobilized um, some funding and uh, sent some, I think it was one boat, maybe it was a couple of boats, up and down the coast um, to do some really intensive surveying for the organism, for the um, for domoic acid, um, and doing cell counts, and just really trying to understand what happened. And so if you're interested in, in that event as a whole, uh, McCabe put out a paper at the end of last year that describes all of their findings. But I'm going to get back into uh, what was going on in Monterey Bay. So right out here on the beach, we had uh, die-offs of um, anchovies. We had marine mammals that were feeding on those anchovies and dying. This particular uh, pelican, brown pelican, did um, test positive later for domoic acid poisoning. And um, sometimes you'll see during event sea lions that are affected. This is a sea lion off the Washington coast, but we have them here too where they um, show signs of distress. So they start um, seizing, They're, they have weird contorting patterns to themselves, um, they have weird scr uh, scratching um, issues, and so that's a definite sign of domoic acid poisoning. So what the heck caused all of this death and destruction? Well. Pseudonychia. Um, it's a pinnate diatom. It's bilaterally symmetrical. Each of these uh, cells right here fits together like a petri dish. It forms chains. This one's four uh, cells long, but they can get much longer, upwards of 100 or more uh, cells long. They are autotrophic. They primarily reproduce asexually, although they do have a sexual phase. 
And to date, there's been 40 species described with 12 of those producing domoic acid. And these numbers are not static. They change um, with each ongoing year of research. So one of the problems that we have in trying to monitor for pseudonychia or just trying to detect it in a number of samples is speciation. So really you can only, using light microscopy, you can only bend them into two different size groups. You've got the sort of the um, wider cells we call seriata size class and you have the skinnier cells that we put into delicatissima size class. So you'll hear me using those two terms uh, throughout the talk. And these are two uh, species that are within that larger seriata size group. And you can see, you know, looking under a light microscope, it's really hard to speciate these things, and especially if you put those in a big gamish, like a net toe or something. Um, and so, but it's important to distinguish them because Australis here on the left is highly toxic, whereas Fraudulenta here on the right is, um, it produces toxic, but nowhere near yet um, producing the levels of domoic acid that we see in Australis. Um, and they are different. I mean, this is just a very small snippet of their um, ribosomal DNA. And you can see here just, you know, several base pairs different um, between the two. So they are, in fact, different. And there are other methods you can use. So you can do scanning electron microscopy. So you're cleaning away all the organic matter, and you're left with these uh, silica-like skeletons. And so there are a lot of different metrics that you uh, can use in um, defining these species, um, the stri, the inner stri, the number of poroids, the number of chambers per 10 microns. There's a, there's a table about, of about 12 or so metrics that you use to speciate. And fraudulenta is one that you can uh, really pick out because it's got these sort of pinwheel um, poroid patterns internally. So when you get down to this level, it's pretty obvious that you have something different. But if any of you here have been doing SEM, it's, you know it's really tedious and you know, quite pricey to look at a lot of samples in a monitoring program using something like that. Um, and so I've mentioned that pseudonychia makes this um, molecule called domoic acid. It is an excitator, excitatory neurotoxin, so it binds to neurons. There's a long depolarization period, um, and this leads to increased intercellular calcium. And so you end up with swelling and death of the neurons. And just like with a lot of these harmful algal bloom uh, toxins, it gets into the marine food, food web, and that's where you really get issues. So you have your, your toxic gamish here at the top. Um, so pseudonychia would be up here. And then, of course, you have your filter feeders here uh, that take in water, and so they're going to concentrate those cells and that toxin. Uh, fin fish, like you saw the um, dead anchovies, will take in that water and toxin as well. And then, of course, we all know that marine mammals and birds um, and us, we all love um, our crustaceans and our bivalves. Uh, and so these can, this um, toxin can manifest itself in a couple of different ways. So amnesic shellfish poisoning has been uh, the term given to uh, the illness that humans get when they eat tainted uh, seafood. And so it usually starts out with generalized GI issues, dizziness, um, but then it's, it's called amnesic shellfish poisoning because uh, it is associated with uh, memory loss. And then you have domoic acid poisoning that uh, manifests itself in marine mammals. I guess they give a different title because you can't really ask a sea lion if he forgot what he did that morning, right? So people know they have short-term memory loss. Sea lions don't. So, um, but what manifests in them are seizures, head weaving, uh, scratching, that weird contortion that I showed you. Um, and so because of that, Pseudonychia, the genus, is known as um, a hab, so because it um, it develops these harmful algal blooms. There's many other HABs out there, but right here in Monterey Bay, this is really the one that um, is top of the list in terms of um, issues that we have. So why does it even produce DA? Why, you know, doesn't really make sense why it would be um, making this molecule. Uh, there are a few hypotheses out there, and one of the ones that has sort of stood the test of time is that um, this molecule will chelate trace metals that are needed for biosynthetic pathways. So you can think about all the trace metals that are out there uh, in the ocean's water, so iron, uh, magnesium, zinc here, and those become part of metalloproteins, and then those, of course, are um, part of 
things like electron transport system and nucleic acid replication. But there are real challenges to experimenting in the field in terms of looking at upregulation or downregulation of genes because we don't know the genes. Um, there are some putative genes that are involved, but the um, pathway of DNA, DA synthesis hasn't been fully elucidated, and um, nor have the, the genes. Um, and so there's also many factors that are associated with DA production, so that complicates matters even more. And this diagram is from a great review a few years ago by Lelong et al. And this just shows all the different factors that can um, affect the uh, affect DA production, whether making uh, the organism make more DA or less or no uh, impact at all. And they can kind of be put into four different groups here. So you have your nutritional uh, factors, biological, physical, and internal. So of course you have your trace metals down here. We just talked about. Silica here, which is very important. Um, I forgot to mention the frustule that's left behind um, when you do those SEM preps uh, is made of silicate. And so that's what really you can use to identify. Think of it as like the skeleton that's left behind. And then of course you have your macronutrients. Um, and then you, there's also been work showing that there are certain bacteria that are associated with toxic versus non-toxic um, outbreaks and species and culture. You also, of course, have your, your typical physical uh, parameters in terms of salinity and temperature. And then, of course, the internal nature of the cells. What growth phase are they in? What, what are the age of the cells? And so um, a lot of these arrows are dotted because you know one study shows one thing, and then another study shows something else. And much of this, of course, has been done on cultures and isolates in the lab. And so you're controlling for some things and not other things. And you can imagine trying to do something, trying to relate this to the field where you just have a completely dynamic system that could be changing. Um, and so really it's about synergy, right? I mean, you can't, there's not one thing that's happening in the field that's really triggering this. There's all different um, things that are occurring together. So there are a lot of gaps in our knowledge. Um, I mentioned the not knowing the, the genes uh, precisely that are involved in DA production uh, and about the biosynthetic pathway not being elucidated. There's also a question of uh, resting stage. Does this genus have resting stages um, like other HABs do? Because we do tend to get uh, formation of blooms kind of out of nowhere, and then they'll disappear for a while. Like out there now, there's been several months of no pseudonychia, and now all of a sudden it's starting to crop up. Where did it come from? Is it just being evicted in from offshore, or is there a resting stage? Uh, there are also biological factors that have been described. A um, little bit of fungal parasite work has been done for Pseudonychia, but not much. Uh, viral control, there's not a lot of research out there on that either. Um, other HAB groups have shown uh, that viruses can control the, the uh, bloom termination, and so we don't know if that's playing uh, in a role in Pseudonychia blooms or not. I mentioned that they do have a sexual reproduction phase, but it's rare to catch that in natural samples, and we don't know if uh, it's even related to DA production. So lots and lots of questions. Um, and so this is a map. It's actually a few years old now, and it really only shows about 14 of the known Pseudonychia species. And uh, as you can see, it's, it's just everywhere. And some of the species are more ubiquitous than others. We call those cosmopolitan species. And wherever you see uh, a circle, that means at least one isolate from that area has shown to produce toxin. And then, of course, we have these hot spots uh, all around uh, the country, but really focused here on the West Coast. So I'm going to give a little bit of history here um, about Pseudonychia right here in Monterey Bay. Uh, back in... so. It kind of, the timeline starts in the 60s, but if you go back to the literature, uh, there are a lot of descriptions of uh, Pseudonychia, well, they call them Nitsia uh, back then, Nitsia species, I think back to the 30s. And so it's probably been around for a while. Uh, and so some of the early events, you know, you have to, um, you have to decipher because you don't know if it was actually Nitsia present or Pseudonychia, um, so you don't really know how long it's been around. And some of you, 
may have seen or have heard about. This is kind of local folklore. <laughs> well, it really happened, though. Um, there was a seabird invasion up in Capitola. I think it was sooty shearwaters were falling out of the sky and acting weird and sickly and things like that. Um, that was back in 61. And then lo and behold, Alfred Hitchcock comes out with a movie called The Birds, which I don't know if anybody has seen that. Um, it's still on my to-watch list in Netflix. Uh, so, um, but there's a question of um, uh, how, you know, was he actually influenced by this event? Because he happened to be visiting, I think, uh, at some point near this, the time frame of this happening. Um, but he was also, at the time, supposedly working on a... Um, a movie translation of some 1952 story about the birds. So um, if you've been around locally, you'll hear this, uh, this reference sometime. Uh, and so for a long time, scientists said, yeah, probably it was a Sudanichia bloom. And, and you know, these birds got sick and they ate the fish and, and you know, it was DA poisoning. And then other people uh, had their other opinions. But lo and behold, it wasn't until 2012 Bargu et al. got their hands on some old uh, preserved zooplankton samples from that event. And they were able to pull out these uh, cool frustules from the guts. And so they were able to speciate down to Australis. So we can kind of comfortably say now that, yeah, that probably was really a DA event. And so that one, I mean, as far as we know, unless um, others were never reported. That was really the first um, DA event in our area anyway. Then in 1987, uh, this really put Sudanichia and domoic acid on the map. It didn't happen here, um, but this was the first documented case of amnesic shellfish poisoning in Prince Edward Island, Canada, on the eastern side. Uh, three people died and over 100 got sick from consuming contaminated mussels. And um, fast and furious work by a bunch of scientists figured out that indeed uh, uh, Pseudonychia multiseries was the causative organism. And this was important because it was the first time that a diatom was shown to be a toxin producer. We knew before that that dinoflagellates could produce toxins, um, but, uh, but not these, no diatoms to that date. So then lo and behold, a couple years later, we had another large event here. Uh, we had the death of over 100 brown pelicans, brants, cormorants, and sea lions. Uh, again, those, those silica-based frustules were used to identify uh, Pseudonychia in the guts of these uh, dead birds. And so researchers from UCSC, Mbari, um, a whole host of people, um, started uh, uh, really jumping on this problem because we didn't know, you know, after the Prince Edward Island event, what the heck might happen here. So uh, they worked and confirmed the presence of several toxic as well as non-toxic Pseudonychia species here. And they began to develop uh, different types of probes to be able to um, put in the field to uh, monitor and to study these organisms. This happens to be a, a whole cell hybridization probe. And then that brings us to the next event, uh, which also happened to be an El Nino year. Uh, this was 97, 98, a uh, big sea lion death. Over 400 died, but many more showed um, those characteristic neurological signs. And uh, DA was confirmed in the body fluids uh, of these guys uh, and also the anchovy diet. And then that brings us up to 2015, which I just mentioned at the beginning of the talk. We actually had record-breaking toxicity here in Monterey Bay, um, and it's, it was part of that large bloom that lasted for months all up and down the West Coast, and that Dungeness crab fishery that I mentioned being closed. Uh, the last uh, value I saw was a loss of more than 48 million, uh, just to California, but I think that probably uh, that number is a lot higher now. So why is Monterey Bay such a hot spot for, um, in particular, Pseudonychia? But as I mentioned, we do have some other HAB issues. Um, there are a few processes that go on out here that really uh, characterize it as a hot spot. And this is a, a paper from John Ryan over at Imbari that really outlines these. So you know we have the deep canyon. We get these um, upwelling, this offshore upwelling, and that brings in nutrients that phytoplankton love. Um, and so you'll get this these upwelling events there and as well 
here from the deep canyon. And so, you, so the nutrients come up and then the um, water will sort of have this relaxation event um, and that uh, allows for perfect temperatures and nutrient uh, regimes for these phytoplankton to respond. So we also have riverine input. We have a couple of major rivers that, that dump in here. Um, and these can bring in the nutrients. And also those trace metals can be associated with sediment that comes in as well. And this is some data from uh, Rafe Kudela's lab at UCSC. And they go out after these first flush events. So you know the first rain, major rain event of the season will bring in all the nutrients and all the uh, trace metals or sediment, whatever, that's been collecting on land from these ag areas. And so they go out and they do a transect before that rain event and then a few days afterwards. And here they're using particulate DA. You'll see PDA a lot in the, um, in the graphs because that's the, the DA that's associated within the cell. Uh, and then you do have a dissolved fraction, but this is uh, typically what we report and um, focus on. And so, um, and it could be part of aggregates as well. Uh, so anyway, in the gray, you can see the, the stations that they did before the uh, event. And then you can see the response in DA after the event. So clearly, there was a, a Pseudonychia population there that responded very happily to this, um, this uh, river, this particular uh, flush, which was a few years ago. And so we also get then these areas where when you do get upwelled waters and it can also bring up the sediment from the bottom and when that interacts with uh, your phytoplankton, again, if there are trace metals uh, present uh, within the, the sediment um, and we believe that that's affecting toxicity, then we can see um, you know, uh, pseudonychia cells respond in that manner. And indeed, uh, another John Ryan paper here um, they happened to be out mapping chlorophyll a few years ago, and they grabbed samples uh, you know, throughout this patch. And when they got back to the lab and ran them for domoic acid, they found something really interesting in that the samples where they collected from the interface between the phytoplankton, the, that chlorophyll um, layer, and the sediment where they were uh, interacting, they actually saw higher uh, domoic acid there. And then uh, finally, you have what's called a retention zone up here. And um, that's just the way you know, the land is, the winds are. Um, you get these long residence times. Uh, cells can you know, react to those uh, nutrients and proliferate and then add vec to other parts of the, um, of the bay. So you can see all the processes that go on and you know, dynamically what's happening. And then just to remind you, <laughs> bringing back in all these different factors that can also be changing at the same time in terms of when river uh, flow comes in and upwelling occurs and that kind of thing. So what happened in 2015 here in Monterey Bay? Well, the physical conditions, even though things were warmer offshore uh, within the bay, actually the temperatures were, um, were pretty normal. Uh, and so we had these intermittent upwelling events and um, so you'd have the upwelling and then sort of stratify and relax. And this, this did it a few times, almost like pulsing. And um, we got a lot of cell growth and accumulation. And uh, John Ryan, uh, he's got a paper in press now about the chemical changes that happened. And so when we had this cell, really high cell growth and accumulation of cells, you get high biomass, of course. And uh, we had a drawdown then of silicate. So a silicate exhaustion over a few years that was happening. And so just to remind you again, those skeletons are made of silica, so it's really important for diatoms. Um, and when they're deprived of silicate, they get pretty ticked off. And it's been shown uh, many, many times over and over that um, when you deprive them of silicate, uh, DA production goes up. And so when he looked at the data from long term at the M1 buoy, um, he found that this uh, silicate anomaly was really happening over the past couple of years. Um, and so this is your, your uh, 
your mean here, and then, uh, but we were below average there. And so um, we're actually 60% below the long-term averages. And it just, because of the, the amount of cells that were out there and they were drawing down that silica, it just, the system could never bounce back. So uh, I'll switch gears now and talk a little bit about how we study these bloom dynamics. Uh, and so I mentioned those probes that were developed back in the 90s. Um, they're still in use as part of uh, some wharf monitoring programs that go on. So at Santa Cruz Wharf and Monterey Wharf, they are sampled uh, every Wednesday, 300 and, or 52 weeks a year. Um, and so up in Santa Cruz, they use species-specific whole cell hybridization probes to detect a couple of different species. This is Australis up here. This is the organism that caused that Prince Edward Island event. And then in Monterey Wharf, Jason's group does uh, light microscopy uh, every week of those two different size groups that I mentioned. And then of course, it's always important to collect ancillary data to kind of put, you know, get this into a holistic approach in terms of what's going on. So of course, you want to look at your demoic acid, all your general water quality parameters, uh, phytoplankton counts, and even the weather, just to get a whole uh, picture of what's going on. And these data are being used to inform modeling efforts. Um, and then the, the key in HAB research is to have these predictive forecasts so we can um, say what might happen that next year. And so just to show you how different things can be, uh, remember Santa Cruz Wharf data are derived from um, those whole cell hybridization uh, um, results. And so those are shown in green. So wherever you see the, the green spikes, that means we had the organism was there. And then wherever you see a brown spike, that's actually where we detected demoic acid. Um, and you can see, so the red line here is kind of a rule of thumb in terms of um, uh, a bloom threshold. So you can see we we get over that quite frequently, um, but you can also see the variability within the different years and how sometimes you'll have organism but not much um, uh, demoic acid, and then sometimes you'll have an offset here of where you have a spike in the, the organisms, but then you have a spike in demoic acid. And then some years we don't have any of those two toxic organisms that we um, that we test for, uh, nor do we have demoic acid. However, we do know that SUDs were present that year. So if we switch down to the Monterey Wharf uh, data, remember this is light microscopy based on these two size classes. And that 2013 at Santa Cruz Wharf, that showed no demoic acid um, and you know, no Australis in particular. Um, actually, we had a ton of Sudanichi in the water that year. And so we're really interested in why some years we get a toxic year, some years we don't get a toxic year. Um, and also getting, I'll show you some data in a bit about really drilling down more into the species that are present, because we've been a bit limited by um, the probes that we have available and also just doing bulk counts. So now I'm gonna talk about some deployments that we did as part of that EcoHab project uh, over the past few years. So when we would do a deployment, they were generally about a month long, um, but of course we would tap into the wharf time, uh, time series data. Uh, and so we would put out ships, we used the Martin and the Carson, we'd go out um, several times over that month period uh, for you know, spatial sampling. And then we also would deploy two environmental sample processors, which I'll describe more in a bit. Um, and those give you a nice time series, but they are at a fixed depth. And then we also worked with an AUV, uh, and that allowed us to do more adaptive sampling. And so um, I'm gonna concentrate then, uh, just to talk a little bit more about these two platforms. So this, the environmental proce uh, sample processor this is the 2G. The 1G is even larger than this. Um, and this was started by Chris Scholin back in Woods Hole a million years ago. And now, of course, he's a CEO of Imbari. Um, so the, uh, these things, like I said, it's, it's basically a lab in a can. And they go in a fixed location. Here's a diver that's putting one down. And what's great is you can get species identification and toxin identification from a similar water mass. And so it's really important to be able to marry those two metrics. 
And um, as I mentioned, this is time series data, so we can put it out and have it sample once a day. Uh, if there's nothing happening, we can change uh, the mission on, a, on the fly and uh, have it wait a few days before it begins sampling again. Uh, and then, of course, again, it's very uh, important to get all those contextual measurements, temperature, salinity, and chlorophyll to start putting uh, the story together. So this is the guts of the ESP here. Um, the water is pulled in from a whole water is pulled in to a port up here. And uh, it gets concentrated onto a filter in this titanium puck. It's about that big or so. And those pucks go in these, um, this carousel here. And it's all robotics. Um, and the cells, that, that puck gets moved around. And so, of course, the cells need to be lysed first. So there's a heating uh, element involved. Uh, and then once your cells are lysed, you get genetic material um, in your gamish, or you'll get your demoic acid in the gamish. And there's an adherence to an array, which I'll describe in a minute. And it gets uh, a series of as assay reagents get applied. So if you've ever done DNA extraction on the bench, it's basically that, but putting it into a robot and throwing it out into the sea and talking to it from shore and telling it to sample. Um, and so you end up with a chemiluminescent end reaction um, that's then, there's a picture that's taken and relayed back to shore, and that's how we can make uh, decisions about what, uh, if we want it to keep sampling or not. And so the, uh, for species identification, we use something called sandwich hybridization assay. So we have uh, one of those pucks in the series has a, a filter in it that's actually um, spotted with our genetic um, uh, capture probes. So these are species specific down here. And then once you have your gamish in the machine uh, that's got your genetic material in it, if your target is in there, it will um, anneal to your capture probe. And if that part of the sandwich has happened, then your, uh, your pseudonychia specific probe will bind. And so this, this is what's called the sandwich then. And there's a conjugate and a substrate that's added, but basically you're getting a horseradish peroxidase uh, cleavage. And so that reaction's giving you your signal. And right here uh, is an image of one of those arrays. So each one of these lines is a different species. These super bright ones are just for our orientation, so we can map those back to um, uh, how we printed those particular species on the array. And then we've, prior to this, we've done um, standard curves uh, before we deployed the instrument. So we can uh, take those uh, dots and basically convert them to um, pixels and, and then relate that to our standard curves and see how much we have out there. And so for toxin identification, there's a competitive ELISA that's used on board. This is kind of a super busy slide, but basically what you're doing is you're um, combining your, if you're combining your gamish that may or may not have demoic acid in it with an antibody first. And so if that happens, if there's a DA there, you'll get that binding and that'll be washed off and it won't even see the array. If you don't have much DA there, if you have no uh, DA there, then that antibody will um, attach to, um, to the immobilized uh, DA that's on the uh, array. And, so, and then you get a secondary antibody response. Same thing with the horseradish peroxidase uh, reaction, and so you get a signal. And because it's that competitive nature, uh, it's the opposite. So if you, get, um, if you get spotting here, then that actually means you don't have much DA in your, in your sample. But the same thing, we can get an image. Um, this happens sequentially after the, the genetic detection, and so we're able to characterize what's going on in the, in the water column out there. And so one of, the th one of the things I worked on while I was there was expanding the number of species probes that we had on those arrays. Uh, but another thing that, fun thing that kind of came out of the work, too, is that we realized that the methanol extraction for DA was um, not very harsh. It got rid of all the organic matter um, and our, our molecules that we were looking for, but it left behind these nice uh, frustules. And so with a little bit more cleaning up, we're able to pull these frustules right off of the uh, the spent pucks, and there you can do your one-to-one -one comparison of what you found on the pucks in terms of frustules with what you found 
with uh, domoic acid. And so these aren't Pseudonychia, but I just thought they were really cool and I threw them on there. <laughs> but because it works for all diatoms. And sort of just as an aside, a few years ago we had a, an ESP out in a huge titanium sphere down to about 800 meters. And we were also able to pull off Pseudonychia uh, frustules and some other cool diatom frustules. And this was neat because we did have a qPCR um, on board, and I believe that was the first uh, report of being able to do qPCR in the ocean. Um, and so it was nice to be able to relate that we actually found the frustules on there as well. So I also mentioned that we put out uh, an AUV during these deployments, and as I mentioned, it can do mobile and adaptive sampling. So we have a suite of onboard sensors and algorithms that will detect uh, various features. So it can use temperature to, um, to detect fronts, or in our case, of course, uh, chlorophyll for chlorophyll patches. It's got this set of 10 to 20 spring actuated gulpers, and what's great is it gives a snapshot of the environment across um, space. And so I'm not going to go into this slide too much. If you're super interested in how the algorithms work, um, I'd point you to Yang Wu Zhang's papers. But Basically, it does a yo-yo pattern through uh, the water column. So as it's in, it's, it's smart sampling. So as it's going up, it's continuously taking measurements for temperature, chlorophyll, salinity. And again, we were looking for chlorophyll. So as it, as it goes up and starts to go back down on the uh, descent, it uses those measurements to sort of smart guess, oh, where was that chlorophyll patch? I want a sample from that. And as it goes back down, it will trigger then a sample from that area. So, you know, you can get 10 to 20 nice samples across uh, through a chlorophyll patch. And so each of those gulpers then gives us about uh, a little over a liter to work with, which isn't a whole lot of water, but it's enough to do a lot of different analyses. And again, the goal here is to be able to do as many analyses as you can. Uh, from one slug of water. And so, of course, we can do light microscopy and SEM from this. We can get um, domoic acid measurements as well as chlorophyll, uh, nutrient analysis, and then we introduced something with our colleague um, called ARISA. And basically, this is using two, it's automated ribosomal energetic spacer analysis, which is a mouthful. But basically, what you're doing is you're um, you're doing PCR. One of your primers here is, uh, is tagged with a um, uh, fluorophore. And then you're amplifying across this, uh, this length variable region of the um, uh, ribosomal RNA operon. And so we're not actually getting a sequence, but what we're getting is the length, because this ITS region can vary with length in Pseudonychia. And then as you run these off on a bioanalyzer or a sequencer, um, obviously your smaller ones are going to come off first, just like a regular gel. Your larger ones are going to be last. And so then you can map these peaks back to species that you know that you've mapped before using culture material. And so that's really get, helping us get over this, this probe uh, issue where they are too specific, but also being able to drill down into species out here. So just contrasting a couple of bloom years here. Um, so 2013 versus 15, this is the large um, toxic bloom that um, I've been talking about. And this is the DA, these are the DA uh, res results from all of the different platforms that we put out. And here's that non-toxic year um, that we later figured out was uh, this non-toxic fraudulenta. You can see there's some toxicity offshore here. And note, too, that you're like an order of magnitude off here on the scale. So it really was an unprecedented year for toxicity out here. And so just to remind you then of the 2013 transect that we did, um, I'll walk you through what this um, AUV transect allowed us to put together as far as a story. So here it is going across this cold water filament here. Um, and so when we got the samples back, this is the inshore um, uh, profile, and this is the offshore in terms of chlorophyll. And sure enough, when we looked at, uh, so each one of these white dots here is where the um, AUV sampled from, and then the larger white circle is how much uh, DA was found there. So we did have this larger um, offshore population of uh, toxic pseudonychia. Jason did the counts and found that it was almost all seriata class, probably, we guessed probably Australis. Um, 
And then when we did ARISA, we did the technique, sure enough, we did find that uh, the relative abundance of Australis was uh, more offshore than it was in the inshore uh, population. So this technique's really allowing us now to start to really drill down into these, uh, these species. In 2015, the same thing, we did a, a different transect. We had a um, subsurface chlorophyll layer, almost all dominated by Syriata size class in the counts, uh, record-breaking toxicity, and of no surprise, we got, um, it was just completely almost blown out by Australis. I still think it's pretty fascinating that we do have a little teeny bit of diversity here that sort of hangs on even in these monstrous blooms. So if you remember back then to the ESP, that lab in a can, um, this is from 2015, just showing uh, how things were different in the north and the south. We had them deployed at the same time. And here's that uh, large population of Australis here in black, both um, places. And then um, we did have a background of fraudulenta for whatever reason. Um, at both locations, and then of course your PDA that was just off the map, which interestingly was higher in the south pretty consistently. Uh, and so I mentioned that the ESPs are at a certain depth, and um, you can see here where the ESP remained in, in relation to the chlorophyll layer. So we weren't actually even sampling in the chlorophyll layer, so who knows what was going on down there in terms of toxicity. So just to kind of sum up, again, we're still teasing apart all this data from 2015, but um, we did see intermediate, or sorry, uh, uh, put the wrong word. We saw this upwelling and relax, uh, uh, relaxation period that became perfect for the cell growth. Um, so they were, you know, I mentioned it was kind of pulsing with, um, uh, upwelling, bringing the nutrients, and then you have these relaxation events that the phytoplankton really uh, enjoy. You had that drawdown of silica, and that triggered uh, DA production. And so we were really able to get out there with an integrated sampling network of those fixed platforms as well as mobile platforms, and um, to really get high resolution sampling um, both spatially uh, and through time. So we did see, no surprise, Australis was the dominant species. Um, and we did see those high cell abundances in uh, subsurface layers with both the AUV and the ESP, even though, as I mentioned, I think we were actually missing the real brunt of the storm in the south with the, uh, the deployment of that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we did have more cells uh, and demoic acid in the south. So I think I have a couple minutes. I was just going to um, mention we have a couple future projects going on. One, we're working with... Uh, the Kudela Lab, it's a Packard uh, Foundation funded project, and so we're thinking about how can we sample more efficiently, uh, and to do that we can deploy an imaging system, um, and that can inform us when we should go out and sample, because now it's, you know, blindly every Wednesday, you, you know, we don't know if anything's out there, we don't know in between Wednesdays if anything's going on. Uh, and so, and then how can we use that to detect more than just a couple of, of Pseudonychia species? And so, um, again, we're going to use this uh, ARISA technique that I mentioned, along with uh, Kudela Lab has put out this um, imaging flow cytobot, or IFCB. And so we're starting to get images in uh, of all the different things that, um, are out in the water column, and it's literally taking thousands and thousands of images uh, for us. And so once we know that Pseudonychia is in the water, then we can go out and we can start to grab uh, samples, because what I've been super interested in is that transition period between uh, between blooms. So, you know, as we're starting to ramp up t uh, to a bloom, we have evidence that there's more diversity out there uh, than there is when we get the monospecific blooms. And so I'm really interested in what, uh, it, you know, how those shifts happen and what environmental parameters uh, support that. And so this is really going to help us um, with the high resolution imaging uh, and sampling and then drilling down with that gene genetic technique of ARISA. And then um, I mentioned the, that that was the 2G ESP that we were putting out. This is Embari's 3G. 
And so basically they've taken all those capabilities for the different assay types and they've miniaturized it. Uh, I didn't mention before, but you can do just about 20 or so samples in the 2G, whereas here uh, you have a cartridge of 60. So it will greatly increase the capacity. And instead of those pucks now, we'll have these uh, cartridges here that deliver the different uh, reagents that you need and then the filters down here. Um, and so that ESP then has been married with that um, Dorado AUV type in, uh, vehicle that you saw. And so now we'll be able to go out, we <laughs> as a, um, collaborators, go out and um, actually, you know, smart sample again um, and be able to do uh, detection in the field. And so I just want to acknowledge uh, the ESP and AUV teams through all this uh, work because without them, absolutely nothing happens. Same with the crew of the Carson and the Martin. Um, we had a lot of help uh, up at UCSC with Tom, Tom Uzvinsky, um at the SEM Center and um, Steve Bruzak was uh, responsible for the ARISA, although we're working to bring that technique now into our lab so that we'll be able to uh, to work on it here. And so um, the whole EcoHab uh, big deployment over the past five years was uh, funded by NOAA and then my fellowship was from the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. And I'll just leave this slide up if you're at all even remotely interested in Pseudonychia. These two um, reviews came out a few years ago and they're exceptional in, uh, they're like, this is like a Bible, I carry it wherever I go. Um, and so just for all things Sudanichia, um, and then Trainer at all gets more into the geography and events, because as I mentioned, it hasn't just been a problem here, it's really been a problem worldwide. So with that, I will end there. Okay. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's the problem with all of these, um, all those different factors you see there. Just, you know, different, whether it's in the lab or different locations, um, it's just, it's all over the map. Yeah, which makes it hard for a prediction. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't even, I wouldn't even know where to begin in terms of locally how that helps define things. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think he's, that's still on his radar screen and, um, you know, that's on the radar screen, screen of a lot of these HABs now, whereas a, several years ago it wasn't. Um, and people are really starting to think about that more. Um, I haven't actually done any direct nutrient analyses, um, so I don't have a good feel about um, locally what, what's going on in terms of that. Um, yeah, it's just... That's part of the suite. Yeah, so they're doing it at Santa Cruz. I haven't looked at the latest data, what they're... And J Jason can probably comment way better than I can in terms of the nutrients. Um, and I'm not sure how real time they're running the nutrients to know. Not real, real time reflected. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 I think there are a lot of samples sitting in lots of freezers. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. 
good question. That's a good question. And, you know, basically the physiology, too, of the cells can, can change the DA content as well. So we can get, you know, um, cells that are, that are, you know, relatively low toxicity. So we can have Australis out there, but not really a toxic event. And, you know. Well, the measurements that we're taking are particulate DA, so that's anything that's going to be in the cell. Um, they do take dissolved um, DA measurements too, but we really concentrate on the particulate. So, but you can get extreme variations in your isolates. Even from that bloom that year, we isolated a bunch of Australis, had it back in the lab, ramped it up uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, biomass, and then did DA, and some were really hot, some were not. And so, yeah, it's... And, and just to slightly related, but well, you mentioned 40, I guess, genetically distinct species. Now. Is that right? You say it's always changing. Yeah. Which means, which means it's probably growing. Yeah, for a while there, every year, two or three new species were being described. So then you get down to lumpers and splitters, right, in terms of uh, species. And uh, amongst them, you said there might be 12 Well, I don't think, I mean, they shouldn't, nobody should be really proclaiming that it's non-toxic because I think that, you know, you change, you get it into the right Goldilocks situation of nutrients and um, some kind of silicate limitation or something, and it might bloom. The other thing that's happening, too, is that um, the geography of these things is changing. I forgot to mention in the, um, off of the, the event that happened in 2015, Australis actually hasn't been a problem uh, up off of the Pacific Northwest, but they think because the waters warmed just a little bit, it was able to, the cells were there and probably, uh, possibly transported um, from south a little bit, but um, anyway, they got a bloom of toxic Australis, so now all of a sudden that's on their radar screen, whereas before they were having toxic outbreaks of other species. And so to declare something as non-toxic, um, it's just too much of a dynamic thing that's changing constantly with research, with just our changes in our, our, our global situations um, in the oceans. We're getting it pop, popping up in new spots. Um, things that weren't considered toxic are now all of a sudden shown to be toxic. So. Um, I think we can confidently say that they're, when they do produce, but not say there are ones that never produce. They haven't yet. <laughs> so. You suggested a connection between silica exhaustion and DA production. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's indicative of just nutrient exhaustion and it happened to be silica in that case, or was it specifically to that substrate? And if so, what would be the mechanism by which, or, or even the rationale evolutionarily for why they would be producing demoic acid under silica depletion? Is there yeah, I mean, that, like competition is the only thing really that comes to mind, right? Um, that they're out competing other diatom species. Um, it's just really a black box why they're producing demoic acid and why they bloom like this, because it seems like it would be really physiologically, uh, you know, um, intense to be producing this toxin, whereas why not just have a resting stage, go hang out and wait? And has there been lab work to show that when you actually put it back into silica replete conditions that DA production ceases? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is this, could, could this be similar to you know, the previous examples or, or discussions of dropping a whole bunch of Chevys in the iron deplete waters to cause a bloom, you could actually add silicate to a half? To pseudonychia in so particular. You could add silica to a pseudonychia half and potentially shut it down. Well, you would take it away. So you take away silica, uh, and that's when the DA is produced. That's what I meant. So yeah. if you add silica back to the water, oh, oh, oh. shut down DA production. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, um, haven't tried it. <laughs> we have a, we have a yeah. bunch of planes out here that fly fertilizer and pesticides all 
Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about permitting for that. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Well, and some of the other HABs, they've done um, clay flocculation, especially in China. You know, they just spray the clay and, and let it settle out and, yeah. Yeah, I don't know either. It's also inter interconnected. Um, yeah. And I don't know about other diatoms, how they, how they react. Because I know with the metrics that we do for um, the sued cells, um, we might get some, I haven't seen a whole lot of variability in terms of um, uh, those pieces, parts, the frustral, or the parts of the frustral getting thicker. They might be on minute um, scales, but I haven't detected that in my, the ones that I've counted anyway. Um, but other diatoms might be different. I don't know. I haven't done much with other diatoms. Mm -hmm. Where else does the molic acid come from? Anyway? Yeah, so the, well, what's interesting, what's the story, Jason, you have to remind me, the, um, the Japanese used to give their children, um, was it red algae, yeah. chondria? Yeah. Chondria, macroalgae? Deworming. For deworming, that's right. I couldn't remember what it was for. Yeah, so um, there's been a connection to that. Um, there's been, I think, Nitsia is very low, or is it absolutely? Uh, yeah, there's one species of Nitsia, but it's not increased. Yeah. And the macros, yeah. But uh, it's not uh, not in uh, somebody's uh, heterotrophic protist origin. Is it only in autotrophs so far? Well, it's only in you know the sued group, the genus. Yeah. So there's other um, you know other Habs produce different, completely different toxins. So those are, that's a whole another talk <laughs> about all the Habs and the different toxins that they produce. So there's a, there's a wide array. Um, and again, just as many questions in terms of competition, um, allelopathy, all of that stuff. So, um. all right. oh. One more question. Is there ever any evolutionary benefit for an organism to produce a DA? Does it kill off the other diatoms? Is there some benefit? Is there some yeah, I mean, that's species? sort of the, the question. Is there some kind of competition? Um, and yeah, we just, it's, it's sort of an unanswered question. People have come at it from all different angles to look at why it produces. And um, you know, just that, that leading hypothesis of the chelation, so getting trace metals, you know, being able to beef up their biosynthetic pathways um, but why does this genus do that? Like, what made them de develop to that, you know, level? I, are I don't there species know. that can eat it? Like, are there clams that can eat it and they don't die? Or, or uh, that can eat it that yeah, sort of I mean, survival. Maybe there's a chain. Yeah, I mean, it, it does get into the food. And what was different about the 2015 event too is normally it's just um, you end up detecting it in the viscera. But that one, there was so much out there, it actually got into the meat of the crabs, and that's why everything was shut down. Sometimes you'll see a, a warnings by the health department that if you're recreationally fishing, just to, um, to pull out the viscera and you're fine. Um, but uh, there's been studies to show that it gets in the entire food chain, all the way, you know, from copepods all the way up to whales. Um, so it just depends, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, how toxic the cells are that they ingest um, and how many 